Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to Spanish 410 Spanish Translation with me, Professor Jolly. I'm a Professor of Spanish, head of the Department of Modern and Classical Languages, and your instructor in this course. Um, so what I want to do is, of course, welcome you to Spanish 410. And this is going to be our initial video. Its title is Basic Terms and Concepts for Talking About Translation. Now, what's this all about? Um, well, it turns out that translation, like any sort of industry or discipline, has its own terminology, its own vocabulary. And there are several terms and concepts that I'm going to be talking about on day one or two of class, and so you need to be familiar with them. So pay attention, all right? Um, now I'm going to skip some obvious things, some terms you probably already know, and we're going to focus on terms you might not be familiar with in connection with the discipline or the industry of translation and interpreting. Um, the definitions in this video are going to be brief, on purpose, and sort of informal. Later on, I'll give you some additional presentations or readings, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into these and other terms and concepts. All right, that's pretty much it. And of course, we're going to be learning about these in Spanish as well. This is going to kind of be a, a bilingual course out of necessity. It's a translation course. So that's it. Pay close attention, take notes, rewind and review. And be sure you come to class prepared to discuss these basic terms and concepts. All right, let's get started. All right, so the first terms we're going to discuss today are translation and interpreting, also called TNI, as in the TNI industry, translation and interpreting. Translation is when we go from one language to another in writing, while interpreting is going from one language to another in speech. So try not to confuse translation and interpreting. Translation is written, interpreting is spoken. All right, our next basic set of terms are source text and source language. Now the source text is the original text that you're going to translate from. And the source language is the language of the original text or the source text. So these are often abbreviated as ST, source text, and SL, source language. So in this image I have as an example, you can see that the source language is English and the source text is part of the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, website. So the source text is in English, source language is English. All right, now the flip side of that is the target text and the target language. So the target text is the document that the translator produces, the product, while the target language is the language of the target text. And so these abbreviations are TT and TL. And you'll see those used in this presentation and throughout the course, ST, TT, SL, TL. So again, using the same source text, we can see that the target text would be CDC website in Espanol, and the target language is Spanish. Another term or concept you're going to hear me talk about a lot in the class is genre and genre conventions. So what's a genre? Right? Sometimes you hear people talk about musical genres or film genres. Genres are just types or categories of texts or films or songs. But in our translation class, remember writing, we're going to talk about types of texts. So a genre is just a kind of text. Genres have conventions or rules that texts must adhere to. So to be a comic book, the book has to have certain characteristics. The language is always used in a certain way. The images are always used in a certain way, right? Has a certain range of page numbers. So everything about a comic book has to adhere to the conventions of that genre or it doesn't belong to that genre. So you see some examples, right? If I ask you, what's the genre of this text? Well, it might be a business letter. It might be a tourism brochure. It might be a cookbook. It might be a comic. It might be a magazine advertisement and so on. So genre is a key concept. Another thing we'll be discussing, another set of terms and concepts we'll discuss quite a bit when we're talking about how we analyze source texts before we translate them are the three basic language functions, the informative, the vocative, and the expressive functions. This was introduced by a uh, language theorist named Carl Bueller back in the early, I'm guessing, early 20th century. And he said that all language use can be boiled down to three primary or basic language functions. So anytime we're using language, we're using it in one of these three ways, using one of the three basic functions. Uh, the informative function is when we use language to provide information, to present facts. The vocative 
or appellative or persuasive function, but we usually call it vocative, is when we're using language to influence the reader's behavior, to make a request, to try to convince the reader to do something. Think about an advertisement or a, maybe a warning label or something like that. And finally, expressive, the expressive function, its function is to use language to express experiences, emotions, our attitude, right? What's inside us, okay? So I sometimes call this the artistic function. Think about a personal letter or a poem or a song lyric. Some other terms and concepts we'll use when we're talking about strategizing and maybe deciding which translation approach to adopt. That's on the next slide, I think. Um, are equivalence orientations. Now, equivalence itself is an important concept in translation because if you think about translating, what we're trying to do is produce a text in the target language that is the same. It's equivalent. It has equivalence or correspondence at as many levels as possible. Uh, these two theorists that you see on this slide, Eugene Nida and Peter Newmark, very important in translation studies, they're the ones I credit for coming up with these three types of equivalence. So these are aspects of equivalence when we're going from source to target text that we could focus on, or maybe we focus on all three. So I'll be talking about these a lot in the class, and so will you. First one is cognitive equivalence. That's equivalent content. So the fact, the idea that the content of the target text should be the same or correspond to the content of the source text. That's a no-brainer in translation. We always want to communicate the same content and message. What about formal equivalence? Formal doesn't mean formal or informal use of language. Formal means the forms and structures of the language. Form versus content. So under formal equivalence, the idea is that the forms or structures, uh, the language of the target text, should match that of the source text. So if I put them side by side and just glanced at them, they would look very similar just on the surface. They would have formal or structural equivalents. That's ideal if you can attain it. And then the, the third type is dynamic equivalence. Dynamic equivalence is the idea that the reader experience of the target text should be the same as the reader experience of the source text. In other words, the target text should have the equivalent effect. So these are three different types of equivalence that we can choose to emphasize or prioritize when we translate. Okay, the terms that we're looking at on this slide, register, tone, and style, I like to think of them as sort of the byproducts of language use that we perceive as readers. But they're very important when we're analyzing a source text, but also when we're producing the target text. Register refers to how formal or informal the language used in the text is. Is it very formal? Is it somewhat formal? Is it very informal? Right? Um, how about the tone? Think about the tone. The tone is the attitude that the language used in the text conveys relative to its topic. So this is a medical brochure. Is the tone about vaccinations, is it serious? Is it neutral? Is it playful? That would be weird, right? Is it ironic? So tone is attitude. And finally, style is the particular way in which a text author or speaker uses language. So you can characterize style with words like, oh, that text has a straightforward style, a transparent style, or it's more complex and dense, or maybe it's just kind of a corporate generic style. Or perhaps if you're reading a novel like something written by Mark Twain, you can identify a very individual or peculiar style. So style is the way a text author or speaker tends to use language or uses it in a specific text. Probably one of the most important concepts when you talk about translation and get it all theoretical is the idea of translation approaches. Now an approach what I mean by that is a description of the overall approach that the translator adopted. Sometimes that's thinking about it pre-translation, sometimes that's post-translation, looking back at the product and saying, wow, this turned out more literal or more free than I expected. So translations are usually described as being, you've heard this before, literal translations or free translations. Although there are many other ways to talk about these approaches, 
literal and free are the most classic, traditional, and they are, they are useful. So what do they mean? What does it mean when I say that's a literal translation, that's a free translation? Well, in general, when people say literal translation, they mean that the translator was faithful to the source text and tried to reproduce it as closely as possible in, this, in the target language. So in other words, the translator used source text bias. Everything's compared to the source text in, in terms of form and content, trying to stay as close to the source text as possible. So form over content is another way to think about it, or source text bias. On the other hand, when people talk about free translation, they usually mean that the translator focused on expressing the message in the source text in a way that would be natural sounding to target language readers. And that can often mean taking lots of liberties with the target language um, itself, the target text, target language. So in this sense, it's naturalness of content over form. It's taking liberty with the source text and source language so that it's more natural to target language readers. So like I said, these are the two most kind of famous translation approaches. I have an image up here of uh, the LITV, literal translation of the Bible, and there are other versions of the Bible that are more free translations. Now an idea that's closely related to the choice of translation approach, literal, free, or somewhere in between, is that of translation units or segments. It, this is pretty easy to understand. A translation unit or segment is just that part of a text that the translator focuses on when he or she is performing a translation procedure. And this unit size can vary. It can be an individual word, it can be a short phrase like acquired assets in this graphic or the first quarter. That's a phrase that you're not going to break up. That's a unit, right? Um, it could be a thought or an idea in a translation approach that's a little bit more free. It can be an entire sentence. So instead of saying, I'm going to focus on an individual word, I'm going to read that sentence. What's the thought or idea that sentence is expressing? And I'm going to try to capture that in a different sentence in the target language. That would probably correspond to a free translation approach. Or you might even do something like, I'm going to look at the whole paragraph. What's that expressing? And I'm going to paraphrase it, right? Which is an extreme, extreme free uh, approach. So in general, literal translation approach targets shorter units and free translation targets longer segments. But the important thing is the translation unit or segment is that little part of the text that the translator focuses on each time he or she is making a decision about what to do. So I alluded to translation procedures on the previous slide. Translation procedures are different than approaches. Procedures are the specific operations that translators perform to produce equivalents for each unit. So it's related to translation unit. I'm looking at a unit. How do I determine the equivalent for that unit? That's a translation procedure. And there are lots. I'm going to give you guys a reading and another PowerPoint presentation. There's probably more than 25 or 30 different translation procedures that I've identified <laughs> in my extensive research. Um, but here are some examples, right? Loan words or borrowings. So for example, you oftentimes in business texts that are in Spanish or Portuguese or Japanese, you'll find words like feedback, right? English words that have been loaned into that language and are being used. Or standard translation. That's when I use the generally accepted equivalent uh, of a word. Shifts. Sometimes when I translate something from source to target text, it was a noun in the source text, but I change it to a verb or an adverb, or an adjective in the target text to get that same idea across. Direct translation is, is sort of just localized literal translation, right? I see something, a translation segment that's three or four words, and it works to translate it literally to use the closest equivalent words and structures. Generalization is a procedure for individual words. So it's using a more general term for a more specific word. So imagine that I'm translating a document for an auto manufacturer, and I say SUV instead of the specific make and model. That's a generalization. In addition is when the translator inserts material that's not present in the source text. So for example, if the source text references something that's culturally specific, I may have to add a few words to explain it to my reader in the target language text.
And then just as a final example, and remember these are just examples of some specific procedures, rearrangement would be when to make the target text more clear or make more sense, I might change the order of phrases, clauses, or sentences that I find in the source text, just for clarity. Okay, so these are examples of translation procedures that translators apply as they're resolving individual translation problems. All right, and finally, uh, we'll be talking quite a bit in class about different tools and resources. So when I say tools or resources, right, herramientas or recursos, I'm referring to these types of things. Um, professional translators use lots of traditional and online tools and resources to make their translations better and to translate faster. So for effectiveness, accuracy, and efficiency. Examples of the tools that professional translators use are things called computer-assisted translation suites, CAT tools. So computer-assisted translation, CAT. These are suite software suites like, um, well, we'll discuss them in class, okay? But they have multiple tools like terminology bases, translation memories, and machine translation, project management, all rolled up into one computer-assisted translation uh, suite of software. Um, machine translation, right? Google Translate, and believe it or not, professional translators rely on machine translation or la traducción automática quite a bit. Bilingual dictionaries and glossaries, so obviously looking for the equivalent term in the other language, either in a broad dictionary or a more specific, like a medical or a business or a tech glossary. Um, there are monolingual dictionaries that are used to find out what a term means in the, in the source language. Sometimes we come across a term that we don't know. We wanna make sure that we understand the term before we translate it. So we have to look it up in a monolingual dictionary. Bilingual dictionaries usually don't have definitions. They just tell us what the equivalent is. Uh, translators use search engines and websites extensively, right? Whether it's to research a topic, you may the source text may be about something that you have never dealt with in your entire life, like hydroelectric, hydroelectric uh, electricity generators. And so you need to do some research even just to interpret the source text. Or you may use a search engine or a website. You come up with a hunch, you think you know what the equivalent is, and you just want to confirm that. In image search, third bullet from the bottom, is very good for that. Make sure that the thing that I'm saying corresponds to the picture. Well, I'll show you examples of this in class almost every time we meet. Uh, parallel text aligners, if you've ever used the website lingue.com, you type in text and it searches for that text in documents that have been translated so you can see how translators have translated those terms in the past. Super helpful. And finally, language usage forums like wordreference.com. You might want to get onto a website and ask somebody, um, I'm translating a text that uses the term to make a difference, right? How do I say, you know, to make a difference in Spanish? And then people will come and give you some help. So these are examples of the types of tools and resources that translators use all the time and that I will be teaching you how to use effectively and ethically.